dive into the dopamine depths with us today on Zestology as we navigate the digital delights and dilemmas and problems of our modern world. I've got Dr. Anna Lemke, the brain behind Dopamine Nation. She's utterly brilliant and so is her book and she is today's guest. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm an author, presenter at Sky Sports and years ago I went to the jungle and got ill. Very (laughs) ill. So this is my podcast adventure to find more energy. It's packed with biohacking, science, health tech, supplements, and some of the most well-known experts on the planet. This is something I spent four months of my life doing with electrodes glued to my head so that you can do a lifetime worth of meditation. Decide what you don't give a fuck about, which is something you don't care about. Some of it gets quite out there. I had some stem cells sent up to my house that I had stored, and then I injected myself with mannitol. And we even hack hangovers. Alcohol is poisonous. So is water and oxygen in the wrong dosage. So that's my podcast, Zestology. Live life with energy, vitality, and motivation. And hello again. Hope you are well. I'm really ramping up the quality guests in September I've uh, it's just been a great month or two of getting brilliant guests I've got to say thank you to my producer Alison who's managed to get some brilliant people on Zestology and today Dr Anna Lemke who's written the book that just is an instant bestseller Dopamine Nation it has really caught the imagination partly because in this digital world in the digital era the way that we seek pleasure is just so related to dopamine the dopamine spikes that we get and, um, and it's, I mean, it's not just the digital world. She is an expert on addiction and dopamine, and she explains it extremely well. Uh, she's got a hugely um, rigorous uh, scientific background. Uh, she's a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine, chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. Very pleased that she's managed to make time to chat on Zestology. And, you know, isn't it wild how just a buzz from our phones can set our hearts racing? That, that is dopamine in action. And I thought I have to ban myself from the phone in the bedroom. And it's, it's actually, for me, I don't think it's so much about the bright light. I sort of wear blue blockers in bed. But if I, if I go on holiday and I don't have my alarm clock and I've got my phone in the room in the middle of the night and I start looking at my phone, I just can't get back to sleep so deeply. And that's dopamine. Because I start checking, I don't know, Instagram or my crypto's uh, uh, portfolio or the news or whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, I'm getting those little dopamine spikes and I just can't calm my nervous system down. You know, this relentless pleasure seeking, we need a break from it. And um, that is what Dr. Anna Lemke dives deep into. So I'm delighted she's on Zestology. Let's talk about the endless scrolls on Instagram and those late night online shopping sprees and how we might be able to do something about it. Here is Dr. Anna Lemke on Zestology. Anna, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Good, really good, thanks. Um, I'm excited to talk to you, and over the last year or so, I feel like you have come up in more and more conversations with my friends and people that I know. I don't know whether they're trying to tell me something, (laughs) but um, I mean, are you surprised at just how much your book and your work has caught the imagination? Completely surprised. I mean, here was, here's a book that's basically saying on some level pain is good for you. Um, and I remember describing it to a colleague of mine, and he joked. He said, "Oh, that'll be a bestseller." And we both laughed. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, probably not. Uh, so it's been a big, it's a, it's been a surprise and a real honor. Yeah, but I guess what it what what is going on is that it's sort of it's more needed than ever before. And despite the the message of your book, things seem to be sort of getting worse in terms of the just the massive amounts of dopamine we're sort of the dopamine spikes that we're surrounded by day to day hour by hour yeah i mean i think we're really living in an unprecedented time in human history facing unprecedented challenges which is really the challenge of overabundance the challenge of literally being surrounded every minute of the day by highly reinforcing substances and behaviors that we were not evolved for so grappling with what to do about this in ourselves and our children um, it's a, it's an important question. It is, and it's just it's just incredible how 
things proliferate with no guardrails and no rules. Yeah. And uh, as I just told you, I've just been doing bedtime before this podcast started and and our son is four. And we think a lot about the sort of the, the world of screen time and social media that he's going to be entering into. And it's just incredible the way there's no real rules. And all our friends' kids seem to be allowed on social media, even if they're not officially supposed to be on until 13 or 15 and you just think, you know, how can there be rules around smoking, but not around this, for example? Yeah, well, you're taking a viewpoint that I agree with, which is that in essence, digital media and its impact on our brains can be likened to nicotine, sugar, alcohol, um, maybe not as potent in everybody, but for those for whom digital media is really their drug of choice, um, too much exposure and consumption um, it can really be bad for us and for our brains. And that's not the accepted cultural trope. So that means that parents who maybe have some kind of sense that things are not going in the right direction uh, with kids and digital media and digital devices, they're kind of, you know, out in the wilderness sort of having to lay down guardrails and mm -hmm. and limits that, you know, kids who are in their neighborhood possibly don't have. Now, one thing I will tell you, though, is that kids will come home and say that all of their friends get to do X, Y, and Z, and it's not necessarily true. So that's another thing, you know. It could be also that you're just hearing, that, you know, what your yeah. kid wants you to think. But even that's difficult because, again, we we don't have sort of – and when you, when you liken the consumption of digital media to food, for example, I think most parents would agree that feeding your kid ice cream for breakfast is not a good idea. Right. But giving your kid their iPad first thing in the morning, you know, parents don't have that same kind of framework. So the discussion that we're having now is, well, you know, what is the evidence? What are we seeing scientifically? But also, what are we seeing just in people's experience uh, of this mm. new technology? And how can we, you know, how should we raise our children? Yeah. I'm going to move away from screen time in a moment, but you said that's not the expect accepted point of view. Am I sort of surrounded in a bubble? So do, most people don't sort of don't believe that social media and screens are necessarily a bad thing. I think you are in a bubble, as I am too. If you look at the yeah. vast majority of, um, I mean, I don't have data on this, but this is my sense. Just given the ubiquity of smartphone use and use of digital devices and the amount of time that people are spending on their devices, including very young children, um, I think we can infer from that that people do not conceptualize uh, digital products as harmful for kids, right? Because mm -hmm. they're 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 giving their kids devices, um, you know, often and throughout the day. So it, it is it is a new conversation, the conversation around digital media um, being you know like a drug and being potentially bad for kids to overconsume. And then if we widen out to look at dopamine a little bit more, perhaps there is something to the fact that. I am just more stimulated by screens than many other people. Therefore, I see the harm that it can can cause. And I certainly have, you know, addictive tendencies, and I've gone through my own addictions as well, which is perhaps why your work resonates so much. And I really enjoy I really enjoy what you talk about because it's not necessarily for me. I sort of working through the addiction was always about past trauma and the, the behavioral reasons for it. But actually, you come up with a whole suite of reasons why we might be addicted to these dopamine spikes. And I thought one of, the, one of the things I'd love you to do is just sort of define dopamine and what it actually does to us. I know my listeners would love to hear that. And it's sort of, it's something that I wouldn't be able to do very well, but I know that it's important for me to know. So dopamine is a chemical that we make in our brain. It has many different functions, but one of its very important functions is to um, mediate the experience of pleasure, reward, and motivation. It may be even more important for motivation than it is for pleasure, but it's involved in all of those processes. Uh, the more dopamine that is released by a substance or behavior, the more reinforcing it tends to be, which is another way of saying the more willing the organism is to do the work to get the reward. Um, but dopamine um, fluctuates in response to uh, these ingested substances or in response to these behaviors, which is to say after a sudden upward spike or increase in dopamine firing, our brain adapts to that by decreasing dopamine uh, levels, not just to baseline levels, but actually below baseline. That's a dopamine deficit state. 
before going back to the baseline position. And while we're in that dopamine deficit state, we experience enormous craving for that drug as a way to restore baseline or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. And that state of craving, um, you know, is natural and normal and evolved over millions of years of, of evolution in order to get us to be the ultimate seekers, always looking for more, never satisfied with what we have. But unfortunately, that system for restoring homeostasis is woefully mismatched for the modern ecosystem, where we have these drugs uh, at the touch of our fingertips, so that when we experience that craving, we don't wait. We continue to want to consume more and more and more. And over time, we essentially can get to a point where we change our hedonic or joy set point. So our baseline level of dopamine firing ends up in this chronic dopamine deficit level, where then, then we need more of our drug in more potent forms uh, to feel any pleasure at all. And when we're not using, we're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance or behavior, which is anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and craving. Mm. And do you think that even so, when did you, what year did you start writing the book? Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, in some ways I've been writing the book for 20 years because yeah. it's largely <laughs> based on my, you know, my research and clinical work over the past 20 plus years, but I actually probably put pen to paper. Let's see, it was published in 2020, late 2021, and I probably started somewhere in 2018, 2019. Wow. I'm not very fast, and I, because it's, I'm not a professional writer, you know, it was sort of, had sort of like, if I was lucky, one day a week to work on it. Mm. So, so the, the pandemic obviously happened after you started the book, and I wonder whether you, the our habits, our lifestyle habits that have changed over the last few years. For example, me and my wife are both fully remote. And if we don't really make an effort to get out of the house, we don't see anyone apart from on a screen all day. And that it's just so unnatural, isn't it? And I wonder if you observe that even over the last few years, society's habits are taking us even more towards these sort of tendencies towards seeking out dopamine in unusual ways. Yeah, well, COVID was very interesting in that it accelerated many trends that were already occurring, especially uh, the trend toward increasing amounts of time spent with di digital devices and and, and online. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, we we all spent much more time online, uh, or most of us during COVID. But if you look at the problem of compulsive overconsumption or addiction more broadly, in fact, what I saw was. Um, a more varied response to COVID and sheltering in place in the sense that for some people, sheltering in place was really a time of increased wellness and mm. happiness, in large part because people were staying at home, uh, especially if they lived with others together with family, and so experienced a kind of a, a sort of a, a special, very special time of not being constantly stimulated by having to commute, um, having to you know eat in restaurants, go to stores. I engage in in all kinds of uh, commercial promotional, uh, you know, from being in the dentist's office to listening to music in the elevator. So there was kind of a, a kind of a quiet that descended for a lot of people that that um, was actually helpful. And some of my patients who had been struggling with their addiction actually got into recovery during COVID. So I think you know it, it sort of depends. I, I liken it to musical chairs. It sort of depended who you were and where you were when the music stopped. Right. Yeah. Because one of the things I've heard you mention before is that one of the issues now is that, and I was quite surprised to hear you say it, that um, modern people, for modern people, often life is even harder. And you sort of think, well, we've got central heating and we've got a fridge downstairs. How can it be harder than that for the caveman? But you make the point that we've got everything, so we need for nothing. Therefore, life, we never sort of get pushed outside our comfort zone. That's right. And we were really evolved for pain. We're, we're the ultimate strivers, you know, when we are fighting or battling for a cause, um, you know, especially if it's related to our survival, then we're in our element. But we have all of our, you know, our, our survival needs met. And then we have incredible problems with boredom because there isn't really a whole lot uh, for many humans to do when we have so many machines that have uh, taken over much of the work that we do, made it more efficient, so we have more leisure time, more disposable income. And the truth is that, you know, instead of like reading deep philosophical texts with all that extra time and income, what we're doing is playing a heck of a lot of video games. And all of that, I think, is is driving to growing rates of of unhappiness. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it, it is very difficult 
to be alive now, I think, in ways that are unexpected and paradoxical. Plus, you add to all of that a layer of guilt because we don't feel like we should be unhappy, right? Yeah. Uh, which then makes us more unhappy. Yeah. So this podcast is all about energy. And I think it's really interesting to think about it in terms of addictions. Um, I know my own addictions caused huge spikes of chemicals flooding the system. <laughs> um, to, and eventually they, those spikes weren't even enjoyable at all, but just really intense. But it wasn't me. I didn't ever realize that I had a problem mm. until a sort of a nutritionist that I was working with sort of like, do you want to have a do you want to have a think about this? <laughs> um, I mean, do you is that something that you observe, you know, is a problem for a lot of people, the fact that they might have dopamine or addiction issues, but they don't know about it? Yeah, I would say that's in fact the norm. So most of us do not recognize our problems with compulsive overconsumption um, initially. We often need it, somebody else to bring it to our attention or some circumstance that then prompts us to discuss it with another human, which then allows us to really become aware of it for the first time. And this is a, a curiosity. We, we don't understand why this happens, why it is that we, we lose ourselves chasing dopamine, but it probably has something to do with the fact that a key part of the brain in this reward circuitry is the prefrontal cortex. And what may happen in an addiction uh, in addition to what I've described, this kind of chronic dopamine deficit state where after a while we don't get the spikes, we just get the lows, um, is that we essentially stop talking with our prefrontal cortex, which is that large gray matter area behind our foreheads, so important for autobiographical narrative, future planning, delaying gratification. And we essentially get caught up, get get our, our limbic areas, or sort of our sort of basal forebrain emotion and reward centers um, kind of like start working autonomously on their own without the influence, the top down influence of that prefrontal cortex, kind of putting the brakes on, uh, which is why it's very easy uh, to go from recreational use to addictive use, not see that it's happening, and then kind of be caught surprised by it. Interrupting this podcast for one moment to let you know about my podcast partner, and today it is by Optimizers. Ah, summer or any holiday season, it's such a delightful time, isn't it? But it's not summer anymore. The vacation season is winding down and it is time to get back on track with our health. And if you've struggled to return to your health routine, I have what I think is a valuable lesson to share, and that is focus on the big stuff. So healthy eating, exercise, and the thing that works more than anything else. And we've seen it time again on this podcast, you know, ultimately, you can have all the fancy biohacks and supplements in the world. But if you've had only five hours sleep instead of seven hours sleep, it's not going to work. Sleep is so important. And drinking more than two servings of alcohol, for example, per day for men, and more than one serving per day for women can decrease sleep quality by 39.2%. That's according to the Sleep Foundation. And one of the things you can do to help with your sleep is uh, take good supplements like Magnesium Breakthrough. So taking a supplement to help with your sleep. Magnesium Breakthrough contains all seven forms of magnesium designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. And the sleep benefits are truly remarkable. Once your sleep is optimized, you'll find it much easier to tackle all the other major aspects of your health. You can visit magbreakthrough.com slash Zestology and enter the code ZESTOLOGY10 for 10% off any order. That is only available at magbreakthrough.com slash ZESTOLOGY. And in fact, I've just been to look at that page, and there are some deals which are better than 10% on there as well, if you buy more than one bottle at once. Um, you can use the ZESTOLOGY10 code in the UK on the Bioptimizers site as well. That is bioptimizers.co.uk. And whisper it quietly, that code will work on any by Optimizer's product. They even have another product called Sleep Breakthrough. So it's all about sleep this month as we get back into our routine. Magbreakthrough.com slash Zestology. Enter the code Zestology10 for 10% off any order. Now, back to the show. So then how much is addiction down to something like, oh, a prior traumatic experience? And how much is it um, hormonal, genetic, or just simply the fact that we're sort of 
I guess this would come under genetic, but we're just a little bit more wired to seek out dopamine. So it's all of the above. Addiction is a biopsychosocial disease, which means that the risk factors are biological, psychological, and social contextual. And it also means that a healthy um, intervention is also typically going to have biological components, psychological components, and social contextual components. So on the biological side, it's very clear that some people are born with more vulnerability to the problem of addiction than others. We know from family and adoption studies and twin studies that if you have a biological parent or grandparent with an addictive disorder, you're at increased risk compared to the population to become addicted yourself, even if you're raised outside of that substance using home. We also know that people with co-occurring mental illness have higher rates of addiction. Um, the relationship between addiction and co-occurring mental illness is complex. It's not just a matter of sort of self-medicating, but that can be one doorway into addiction. It might be that those two things together create some third or shared risk factor. But the bottom line is there's a biological or innate vulnerability that varies between persons as they come into the world. Then you have your upbringing, right? So how you were raised. And it's very clear that childhood trauma, among other stressors like poverty, unemployment, social dislocation, can all increase the risk of addiction that's been known for a long time. And it probably does this through a learned behaviors and coping strategies, which is probably also then epigenetic, right? Meaning that that this can potentially change gene expression, which can potentially be passed down through the generations. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you have your social contextual, which is the environment that you live in. And one of the biggest risk factors for developing any addiction is simple access to your drug of choice. If you live in an environment where you have easy access to a given drug, you're more likely to use it, more likely to get addicted to it because it's going to change your brain with ongoing exposure. So all of those things are true. Um, and also there's this whole concept of drug of choice, which is to say what's reinforcing for your brain may not be as reinforcing for mine and vice versa. So you talked initially, by the way, thank you for sharing your own um, vulnerability and problems with addiction. It's always a, a gift. But you talked about how you wondered if it was your addictive tendencies and also your attraction to social media that might make you as a parent more aware of this being problematic for children. And, you know, I think you're tapping into something that's true and real, which is the vast majority of people who use social media and other digital media will not become addicted to it, right? They'll, they might and, and are very likely to develop some problematic behaviors, realize it, and shift course. But there will be a subset of individuals who will get very, very caught up in it and then really struggle to stop even once they recognize there's a problem. And that's true, whatever the substance, whether it's alcohol or cannabis or pornography or what have you. So I think we as a society have to be very respectful and mindful of these inter-individual differences and protect the most vulnerable among us. Yeah. And then here we are in 2023. I mean, how much do you feel that society is starting to get the message or do you think do you feel things are getting worse or better despite the sort of a massive amount of publicity your books had and despite the amount of attention that it's garnered do you feel in general things are getting worse or better i i think that sometimes things have to get worse before they get better um and i think the simple fact that we're talking about this now that, that families and parents are talking about it that that our you know our governments are talking about how can we regulate uh social media um and other uh, you know forms of digital media pornography online gambling all of it um you know we're we're having the discussion mm -hmm. and it is a very difficult problem right because how do you put guardrails on consumption while also uh, respecting people's rights to privacy, uh, respecting people's rights to choose how they want to spend their time, especially adults. Um, you know, it's it's a very difficult problem. And even if we were to collectively agree uh, that we should limit consumption, especially among minors, which I think most people do agree on, how do you realistically do that with the number of posts and videos, et cetera? It's a very, very difficult problem. Yeah. Uh, but, but the fact that we're talking about it uh, is a good sign. Yeah. So there will be a lot of people who maybe have thinking, yeah, maybe there is some compulsive behavior there. <laughs> and, and now it's the happy bit. Let's look at the solution. And you mentioned, you know, sort of changing the behavior or my counselor always said, just take yourself out of the situation for starters. You know, and, and, and what's interesting about that is that especially initially, but even sort of long term, when I think about my life now, 
I'm maybe a bit more boring than I used to be, but that's okay. And I'm quite, I'm really quite comfortable with that. But in the past, I never would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I have this whole dopamine acronym, which the D stands for data. First, be completely honest with yourself and preferably with another human being and write down what you're consuming, how much and how often, focusing on the behavior of the substance that is problematic in your life or that other people have mentioned is problematic, even if you don't see it. So how much are you using? How often? Because it's often not until we actually document and look at that and, and focus our attention uh, on quantity and frequency that we yeah. see it for the first time. And then the O stands for objectives. Try to figure out, well, why am I doing this? Why do I go on YouTube every night for three hours when I plan to read a book? What are prob The P stands for problems. What are problems associated with it? Problems in my relationships, problems with my health, problems in not living according to my values. And then the A of the dopamine acronym stands for abstinence. This is where I invite people to do an experiment where they give up their mm. drug, of whatever it is, for 30 days. And I warn them that they're going to feel worse before they feel better because initially they'll be in that dopamine deficit state experiencing withdrawal. But that's not the pain that they're going to be left with. It's withdrawal-mediated pain. And if they can just abstain from long enough, typically by day by about 10 to 14 days, the craving starts to subside. People are able to be much more present, able to enjoy other more modest rewards. And by the time they get to four weeks, they've got their frontal lobe back online and they can make uh, more informed, better decisions about how they want to consume going forward. It might be they want to continue to abstain. It might be they want to go back to using, but they want to use differently. They want to use less. And then how to create guardrails around that. And do you include under drug of choice, would you include stuff like shopping and porn and that sort of thing? Is it sort of anything that is compulsive behavior? Yeah, we can binge on almost anything in the modern age. And I've probably seen it all. Uh, you know, I talk about my own binge reading of norm uh, romance novels. I've seen people who struggle with online chess, um, especially as it's gotten this shorter and shorter format augmented by social media. Um, online shopping, online pornography, compulsive masturbation, um, you know, YouTube, uh, all, all the social media, uh, all of it really. Um, plus the substances, food is a huge problem. Food addiction, food and binge eating is a huge problem. Um, you know, and all of the traditional drugs as well. Mm. Um, I, a lot of it is escapism, I guess, isn't it? Um, that's what the drug of choice provides. Is that? Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, which then begs the question, why are why are we so desperate to escape ourselves? It's mm. very fascinating, I think. You know, what what is it again about modern life that has us wanting to be outside of our own bodies? Mm. I just wondered in terms of escapism, what you felt about psychedelics in terms of um we've explored them a bit on the podcast recently, but not a sort of mega dose psychedelic, but a very small dose, it would seem to me would bring you potentially more into the moment and less escapism, which actually sort of could be quite helpful in terms of dealing with the escapism that you're trying to find elsewhere. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd like to, I'd like to think that I'm open-minded about the possibility of the utility of different types of substances as medicine. But right now, the evidence for the use of psychedelics to treat mental health conditions is really quite limited. Mm. And by that, I mean these are you know typically short-term studies. The control groups are not great. Um, and even where there is a signal, it doesn't seem to be superior to the kinds of signals that you get with more uh, you know proven and and frankly safer remedies like SSRIs. Um, and in general, just you know, from a conceptual framework, um, I, I worry about using any chemical to change the way that we feel. Um, instead, I try to try to encourage people to get to that mental place without using a substance. So I am concerned about this kind of microdosing to be more present in the moment. There are ways to achieve that kind of presence without using drugs, and that seems to be to be a better long-term solution. Yeah. Yeah. It's been on my mind. I've been reading uh, Ram Dass's book recently, who I believe was at Stanford at some point. Uh, and, Probably. Yeah. I think everybody's passed through Stanford at some yeah. point. But his journey from being, you know, one of the chief proponents of psychedelics to saying, no, actually not that. 
it's all about meditation. <laughs> uh, it's really I, interesting. I think, yeah, I think Ram Das. That I think this is his story where he goes to some see some guru in India and he gives him like this pill of LSD, super potent, and the yeah. guru then has no reaction. Right? <laughs> yeah. he, 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 then he gives him like a double potent dose, no reaction. The point being that you know, yeah. if you become comfortable with your own mind, um, maybe you don't need substances. To mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing book, Being Ramdas. It really is incredible. This, this what a story. Yeah. Um, so, just I mean, just finally on that thirty days, it sounded quite short. The thirty days. You know, thirty days is is like it's the experiment. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like thirty days heals your addiction. I mean, not at all. And in fact, when you when you what I hear from um, patients with very long term severe addictions that thirty days is just the window just starting to crack open. But really, they don't really experience full healing for maybe months or in some cases, yeah. even years. So, um, But 30 days, even for people with significant addictions to traditional drugs like cannabis and opioids, um, is enough for them to begin to see, oh, aha, you know, to get out of that sort of pulsive vortex and see that there, there might be another way. Yeah. Um, so I, I like to, and also 30 days is kind of the amount of time that people can wrap their head around. You know, the nature of addiction is that people are inherently ambivalent about stopping. They can see the problems and they also want to keep using. So when you're trying to hold that ambivalence, it's really important to present a time-limited amount. You know, can you not use for 30 days? If you can't, then you probably need a higher level of care uh, than like this, you know, uh, dopamine fasting experiment. You might need to go to rehab or maybe yeah. you need to go to AA or you need something more intensive. But if you can do it on your own for 30 days, let's let's take a look and see how you feel at the end of that. Oh, definitely. And I'd so encourage people to read your book and try that out because for me, everything changed once yeah. I dealt with the addiction. And, you know, you sort of, all the things that I was trying before, all the biohacks and the supplements and everything yeah. else, useless yeah. compared to actually getting to the root of the problem. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's a great message for people. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I haven't spoken about it that much on this podcast, but yeah, it's been a huge change. Um, so Anna, what is one book that you would recommend to Zestology listeners or one tip for living with more energy and vitality? Okay. So a book that I read recently that I really enjoyed is called The Question of God. It's by Armand Nichols. And it's a fascinating look at the... Um, philosophy and belief system of Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis, and almost juxtaposing, you know, chapter by chapter, their views of theology and of, of, of religion and God. And it's really well done. Uh, it's about 20 years, maybe 20 years old now, but it's a great book that I only just discovered. So that's my- Fantastic. C.S. Lewis wrote a famous book about death, I think I read. It was very, very Lewis interesting. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of famous books. He wrote the Narnia Chronicles, um, in his, uh, you know, spiritual conversion to Christianity, he wrote about that called "Surprised by Joy." He's written a ton, and of course, Freud has a whole uh, anthology of his own. But it's it's just very interesting to compare and contrast their ideas, mm. and it's well written and very accessible. Yeah. And then, what I would recommend for people is um, something that I talk about in my book, which is uh, hormesis, which is intentionally doing things that are painful, challenging, or difficult as a way to get your dopamine indirectly by paying for it mm. in front. This is things like exercise, ice cold water immersion, uh, prayer, meditation, uh, effortful engagement, creating friction in the world, and uh, not just taking the easy path. So those are all the things that we could do, which might be a better way yeah. to, to get our kicks. That's it. Yeah, yeah. As long well, as not taken to an extreme, right? As long as yeah. Not. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Anna, thank you so much. This is normally the time of the podcast where I'd say, "Where can people find you?" But as I know. From my research this <laughs> afternoon, you're not on any social media, are you? That's correct. That's great. I bet you just create so much more because of that. You know, I I, I help. I, I I think I mitigate the risk of going crazy. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't. My brain couldn't handle it. I I just I can't deal with that level of stimulation, so I, I avoid yeah. it. Well, TikTok is the worst. Don't ever go near that. It, it, I did it, it once. And four yeah. hours later, I was, it was terrible. <laughs> it's incredible what it does to your brain. Yeah. Yeah. But you do have a website, don't you? I do. Yeah. Yes. I think it's on alemke.com or dopamination.com, something like that. Yeah. Anna, really good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Heartily recommend your book and all your work. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you to Dr. Anna Lemke. Thank you for listening as well. And uh, remember, my podcast partner today is Magnesium Breakthrough, containing all seven forms of magnesium designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed, especially if you haven't got your phone in the bedroom for a dopamine spike. <laughs> um, the sleep benefits are truly remarkable of Magnesium Breakthrough. And once your sleep is optimized, you'll find it much easier to tackle all the other major aspects of your health. It is a game changer. magbreakthrough.com slash Zestology. Uh, enter code Zestology10 for 10% off any order. And now announcing that Bioptimizers have a new product called Sleep Breakthrough. And if you find that anywhere on the Bioptimizers sites in the UK or the US and you use the code Zestology10, you can get 10% off Sleep Breakthrough as well as Magnesium Breakthrough. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Magnesium Breakthrough. I like Sleep Breakthrough as well, but my wife really loves Sleep Breakthrough too, so she's been taking that every evening as well. You can use the code Zestology10 for 10% off any Bioptimizers order. Thank you for listening and see you next time.